All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington. Today, I'm joined by Ed Enough. Ed is Chief Product Officer at Datastax. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Ed, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. We've got a bunch on the agenda. We'll be talking RAG and vector databases and assistance. But before we do that, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background. In fact, we've got RPI in common. Yeah, we do. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which uh, I think is probably a very chilly place this time of year. It's been a while (laughs) since I've been back. uh, Have you been there recently? Uh, I wouldn't say recently, probably five years ago was the last time. Yeah, so same for me, same for me. Uh, great school for those who haven't been there, though. Small, small, great tech school, but uh, but in upstate New York. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why I chose to move out to the West Coast when I graduated was <laughs> was the winners, winners there. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about... Uh, how you got from there to to here? Yeah, so you know, came out to the West Coast. Really wanted to to get into startups and you know everything that was going on. And of course, this was the early days of uh, of, of things like internet. Well, it was even pre-internet, multimedia, and all of that. Um, but uh, but but shortly thereafter, you know, internet happened and was. Uh, was over at uh, Wired in the early days doing uh, the search engine and uh, and then uh, did a whole bunch of stuff, started a company in, in the enterprise uh, Java space called Epicentric uh, that that had a great run, uh, went on to to do some other other cool stuff, uh, social media, advertising, blogging, was at Six Apart uh, for, for a while, the company that made uh, movable type and type pad. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then went and uh, ended up part of Apogee, uh, the API management company. Uh, we we had a great run there too. Did an IPO, got acquired by Google, and uh, uh, and and after a few years at Google, uh, decided to uh, to to come over to uh, to DataStax, uh, which is the company that makes Cassandra, the Cassandra database, and have been doing that for uh, for for the last few years. So a bunch of cool, fun stuff. Primarily making stuff for for people that are. Are you know building websites, building applications, building content? That that tends to be the type of, of stuff I like to do. I totally forgot about your epicentric connection. I was yes. a very <laughs> early employee at Plumtree. Yes, yes, yeah. So those that that was an exciting. Those time. were the days. So, exactly. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So um, tell us a little bit about. Uh, you know, Datastax uh, has been uh, kind of active in uh, helping organizations um, kind of take on this challenge of using LLMs and and RAG. Tell us about uh, Datastax's kind of angle in that. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, Datastax is is the company behind Cassandra, and and Cassandra was really the original cloud native database. So, awful lot of companies, whether you know Uber. You know, whether you're using Uber, whether you're using Netflix, Apple, uh, these are all companies that use the Cassandra database. And and when you use do something like FedEx package tracking, that's that's all on top of Cassandra. It's all on, on data stacks as well. And so we we knew pretty early on that as people were looking to to first with ML and then as AI and Gen AI became a big thing, we we knew that that was going to be pretty important, that people would want to use the data that they had in, in these systems that power all these interactions, that they'd want to add AI to it. And so we looked at how to add the vector capability, the vector search capability to the database. And uh, and that's that's something that we did. We did it both within our within you know, AstroDB, that's our cloud service, but we've also, everything we do is also an open source. So, so Cassandra 5.0, uh, it's part of the Apache Foundation, has, has this, uh, this vector query capability. And, and, you know, as you know, when you want to get a database to work well with an LLM, and we'll get into it, I, I think, probably in, in depth in a little bit when we talk about things like RAG, but, uh, but the starting point is to allow you to go and, have your LLM within some architectures, and we'll talk about RAG, I think, in, in depth. But 
you want to be able to go and retrieve information from the database uh, on, on a vector-based query. And, and so what we've done is, and we actually did a couple inter- iterations of this. At first, we, we implemented, much like most of the other vector databases that you see, we took the H- HNSW, which is, is the hierarchical navigable small worlds um, uh, approach of, of uh, adding vector query capabilities. We, we brought that to Cassandra. We've since switched to uh, something that's called uh, DISC, uh, uh, DISC ANN, um, which, which is, is a different approach um, uh, that is more oriented towards optimizing uh, DISC IO. Uh, we could talk a little bit about that too, but but the the goal here is to go and, and give you Cassandra, which is one of the most scalable databases for people that don't know, built on technology from Facebook, uh, from Google, from from Amazon, and uh, gives you a scale out data capability. But how do we bring this vector capability to to you know to these large data sets? And that's that's really our angle on all of this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can you drill into the HNSW versus DISC ANN and what those mean and what are the, what are their implications? Sure, uh, you know I'll do my best on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably I probably won't do it justice. So so please, folks on the podcast, don't don't go and like phone in and 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 you know tell me how I screwed it up. But a lot of it. Has, so so you know what what. So let me talk a little bit about sort of the the origins and why everybody ha- has been using these things. One of the amazing things about um, as companies have gone and approached uh, uh, a lot of the the build out on on uh, uh, on on AI infrastructure has been that they've been using a lot of stuff that's been around for for a while. And in fact, if you you know if you talk to to folks, they'll be like, oh well, you know, uh, you know, approximate nearest neighbor and so on. Like this has been around for a while, and in fact. There, there are better approaches that are, that are coming down the pike uh, on this. Um, but uh, the HNSW implementation that most of the databases, most of the vector databases out there ended up using, what came out of Lucene. And Lucene was one of the original... Search engines, right? You know, it started really as a search engine, but but at this point, it's more of, of the, the search library, search infrastructure, index creation a lot of folks mm. use. And mm-hmm. um, I'll definitely get this wrong. Uh, so actually, I won't name names. Um, but other than just say most of the big names that that you would have heard about and that we all talk about when we talk about vector databases, they all started with the code that was in the Lucene HNSW implementation. Uh, and they, uh, they, they, you know, in some cases, they may have ported it over to their language of choice because not all these uh, things are, are you know, uh, written in the same code base, um, but they, they started with that. And that was a good starting point. Like if you were, you know, fill in the blank, the original, you know, uh, vector databases that were named in the in the uh, OpenAI blog post that kicked off the whole vector database race uh, or, the mm-hmm. fi- or the people who came out very quickly afterwards. Um, it's a good starting point. The problem was that HNSW was... Um, not particularly optimized for for disk IO, and so um, you know what what uh, what we found was as we started to to deal with the performance of this, and particularly with Cassandra, that's a distributed database. Um, we went and uh, and and looked at at sort of the the structure and um, essentially the 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 levels of of um, uh, and edges of the graph that gets constructed because basically you end up, you know, breaking these things down. This is where the hierarchical part comes from, um, and then you end up having to do a partitioning, particularly where, um, at, you know, in a clustering. Basically, if you then you this really comes home to roost when you're using a a distributed database because when you look at the way something like Cassandra works, it actually goes and takes a query, vector or non-vector, this is just the way Cassandra works, it takes that query, farms it out to a whole set of nodes. Like people who are running Cassandra have thousands of nodes. And mm-hmm. so if you don't um, if you don't have something that, first of all, allows us to map that hierarchy, hierarchy of where, um, you know, of basically where, where the semantic position is of something in that cluster, and then 
further doesn't go and reduce the number of disk um, you know I/O operations, you you end up you end up hitting a performance wall. And um, and one of the dirty secrets of vector databases is that they all perform really good on small data sets because they effectively end up defaulting to what's in memory. And in fact, in the early days of when these vector databases were coming out, um, a lot of developers you'd read on Hacker News and elsewhere would just joke that like for, for these demos people are doing, you could just do everything in memory um, mm-hmm. you know, on your laptop and you'd get better results. And, um, and, and so that's where a lot of the, the, stuff that we end up looking at for us, you know, particularly for, for Cassandra's role in this stuff, we want to be the one that's doing really large data sets. For example, one of our demos, one of our rag demos that we use, you know, has the entire Wikipedia, Wikidata data set. And that's something like, you know, 500 million documents. And you can actually start to see the, the issues uh, start to crop up in as, in as few as 100,000 or so documents. But definitely when you get into the million plus documents, you start to see that these trade-offs actually have very tangible results in terms of relevancy, uh, not just in terms of the performance, um, but actually starts yeah. to cause fairly significant drop-offs in relevancy, and you just start to get to to junk back. And you see particularly where sort of, you know, all of the vector databases right now are sort of in an arms race with it, because really the the business payoff on all, the, the other sort of important comment about vector databases to understand and databases. Sim- I won't spend a lot of time talking about the database business today, but, but all the databases, <laughs> all databases, whether you are us, whether you're Mongo, whether you're Pinecone, whether you whatever, these are consumption based businesses. And it means mm-hmm. that we, we all love and we all do that, the hackathons and all that, but generally the businesses are built on having very large data sets. And if we can't, if we can't vectorize that very large data set and make it possible to do like production rag at scale, it's yeah. going to be really hard for anybody to, to build a business around this. And so, so that's why mm-hmm. if you talk to anybody who's, who's running a vector database, that the, a lot of the focus is, is about how do we get to these, how, how do we make it feasible and cost effective? There's a big cost dimension to this as well to, to do these, mm-hmm. these really large assets. And that's why all of these choices you know, like we're we're really happy about disk gain in right now. It, it, we we have have a lot of stuff that shows it outperforms in real world uh, a lot of other options. But but we're already going and, and looking at at some of the stuff that that you know some of the different approaches um, you know that that will will move beyond that. Some of them specifically to to distributed database space. No, 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 no. That was that was that was really useful. So disk ANN is a uh, an algorithm and approach for doing approximate nearest neighbor on disk, yeah. presumably. Like, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's It's, it's an infrastructure aware approach for approximate nearest yeah. neighbor. It, exactly. That's its principal difference. There there are there are a whole bunch of other pieces to it that, again, um, I would do too crappy a job of in terms of going into <laughs> detail on. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but, but the principal biggest difference that we've seen has been, you know, we've been, we've been running this stuff you know, as a service since early this year. And so we've, we've had the, the privilege to see a lot of the sort of real world, what happens when you do ragged in, in a real world setting. And, um, and so when you start throwing a lot of, of IO, you know, IO ops, um, uh, you know, IO operations, disk accesses at the problem, you start to get into, into, uh, you start to see a lot of things that you wouldn't see otherwise. And, and you wouldn't see, for example, in a in a classic chat GPT scenario, because they're not, they're not, well, they, they do now because now chat GPT is actually does a lot of rag um, as of, you know, about a month, two month or two ago, but, but you mm-hmm. wouldn't have seen previously in sort of the conversational scenarios that were really just throwing things at the model and, and in as much as the database is involved, it's, it's being used for, for conversation history, which is, is, and it is is a, is a part of rag, but it's not the the it, it's not where sort of the the you know bread and butter of, of of rag really comes home. You made an interesting comment about the implication on not just performance but relevancy as you scale vector databases, and I'm, I'd love to hear you elaborate on that a little bit more uh, for a bit more context. Uh, I've shared here on the podcast and, and elsewhere. One of my observations is that it's you know, really easy to get 
you know, from kind of zero to a POC uh, yeah. with with RAG and with with dialogue agents based on LLMs, but getting from that POC to uh, you know system that you'd be willing to put in front of customers is like a lot harder. And one of the big elements of that gap is relevancy and and you know all the details that go into like the embeddings and constructing the context for the LLMs but at the heart like it's a relevancy challenge um uh and as a corollary to that the folks that that I've run across that have deep experience in search and you know getting search results tuned up seem to kind of get this and and know how to fix this problem uh, I'm wondering a, does that resonate with you? And then B, like talk a little bit more about relevance and and kind of the way you see that playing out in vector databases. Yeah, so there's a couple of different pieces to it. Um, and in fact, there there's actually, and you're going to start to see a lot more of this just in general as people, people talk about um, this stuff. So you've got, you know, you have, have, you know, your precision, your recall, your accuracy, um, you've got ways of measuring those. You've got things like F1 that combine um, precision and recall because they're trade-offs. Um, and uh, and and so you know as we um, you know as 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 we look at those, um, these fluctuate over time, um, and they fluctuate as a function of of the data set that they're operating under. So what this means is so generally, like we we go and we look at at stuff and. Most of your interactions, so it's probably worth sort of, you know, um, there's two ways of two ways of looking at this. You can look at the vector data. Like remember, most of the action around vector databases prior to this year was in using the vector databases as uh, as search engine. That was, you know, if you go back in time, go back to the Wayback Machine, take a look at what what you know what, for example, like big names we all throw around today. Uh, when you're when you're looking at um, essentially, uh, uh, you know, what were these companies doing? You know, um, Pinecone, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the uh, you know folks like Chroma, folks like um, uh, Weaviate, all of that. Like you know, a year ago they were primarily looking at at being search engines, and and the idea was that, and as, as you just pointed out, from search concept, that a lot of this stuff was was rooted in search. And the idea was that keyword search, uh, which is what a lot of folks, you know, uh, more most familiar with, um, uh, you know, has, has a bunch of limitations. It actually works well enough in most situations, but, but we wanted to, but generally people wanted to move from a keyword to a semantic, you know, uh, approach. And so then that's where, that's where doing a vector search, um, uh, comes into play. And, and by the way, you know, you can actually do, you know, really good recall with no LLM really in the loop. Um, uh, well, you do need the LLM, but it's not, it, it, it's not, a, it, let me just say it's more of an LLM rather than LLM. Um, and nowadays we just call it an embedding model um, that, that is just for the purpose of going and reducing your text input into, into a vector that I can now go and do a similar search against. So mm -hmm. now we, we get into this stuff and we're putting in, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're putting in much larger data sets and we, we want to go and try to figure out, okay, uh, you know, uh, how do we go and, and, and how do we measure, um, uh, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, how accurate are these results, you know, basically are, are we, um, uh, you know, are, are we getting, uh, you know, a lot of false positives when I go and, and, and do a search? Am I getting things back? And between accuracy and precision, we narrow down sort of, you know, we, we get, we get um, uh, uh, you know, a, a good sense of, 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 you know, sort of we're able to, to calibrate the, the, you know, sort of the false positives. And then we also get into sort of the recall pieces of it, which which translate down into like things that should have come back. So it's actually sort of more of the false negatives. And again, this is very overly uh, reductive, um, but we start to get into that. Um, and you can start measuring, again, you can measure these things and you can measure them. And then again, I also mentioned F1, which combines, which combines um, basically, because you've got, you, you have, 
uh, you have a trade off um, from from these and and from recall that you want to be able to, to to be able to see. And so, so people have created other other measurements around these. And and um, and again, this is if you go and look sort of over the next six months, just for context, this is where a lot of action is going to be. You're going to go to if you go to any one of these. It's not there yet, but I can predict within a month or two. Uh, there you go. There's my prediction for the new year, which is um, <laughs> when you, when, you know, when you go to a vector database homepage, what you're going to see is, you know, for any of these open source or commercial, you're going to see all these great graphs that show number of documents and what, you know, precision recall F1 score and all of that are, because that's where, like, when you get past, you know, you mentioned sort of the demos, like past sort of going and, and loading a bunch of this stuff in, um, that's, that's where the action becomes. Now, that said, there is a whole but apart from just the raw database capability of, of doing these these results, there's a big piece around um, uh, whether uh, wh- you know actually a big data prep piece um, that goes directly into it, and that's one of the things because you'll hear people say, "Oh, but real world this," and on their right, what they're saying is like it is garbage in, garbage out, and. Um, and so that's where we get into things like chunking and, and so on, where, where I go and I take this piece of content and I need to, to break it into, into a set of things, not just from the fact that, that you, you know, you, you want to get the, the appropriate piece from a storage standpoint, but more importantly, when I chunk these things, when I would take these documents, depending on how I chunk them, I could lose, um, and, and chunking is exactly as the name implies, taking this one might imagine a large PDF and breaking it into bite-sized pieces. I can, I can lose a lot of context that the smartest LLM in the world is not gonna be able to put back. If I happen to, to break things apart on, on, you know, if I did it naively or whether I did it for, with, with a better understanding of the structure of the document. And so, so chunking itself actually um, it, in terms of putting the data in is, is where you see a lot of work. And if you, for example, you know, we look at some of the frameworks people use for this stuff, Langchain and Lum Index. Um, they put a lot of effort into uh, into into going at at the ingestion stage, at going and, and taking what. And, and again, that's part of the reason why Lum Index is named what it is. And actually, as an aside, sort of you get to the differences between those two projects and the philosophies behind them. Langchain, as the name would imply, is about chaining LLM invocations. Lum Index mm-hmm. does that. Uh, you know, um, but in order to do that, Langchain does do a bunch of ingestion stuff. Llama Index, as the name implies, was really about getting that content and building those indexes. Of course, they also do orchestration, but but you see, you know, like, uh, you know, when, when you go and look at, at the folks doing those projects and, you know, um, whether you're talking about Harrison or, or Jerry, like you can sort of yeah. tell they, they both had sort of a different problem they were trying to solve. And, um, and, and again, you know, when we sit down, we're, we're, we have to think when to build like a rag app, we got to think about the end tent, but, but those are, those, they both become big problems. And depending on when you want to go and improve, uh, you know, that the accuracy of your results from, from the vector database, you know, you, so, some people when correctly will go and say, Oh, focus on, on the, the, the getting the data in there. Cause that's going to have a big impact on, on, on your scoring. Um, and other folks come in and say, well, that's true, but but a big other piece of it is is kind of how we break apart and, and construct the context uh, that we're using to get to generate the 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 vector the um, the vectors that we want to look up on and and then what post filtering we do and the answer is both of those are very important. Do you think since you uh, offer it up predictions, <laughs> uh, do you think we'll get to a, a point where this? all happens automatically kind of in the infrastructure and, you know, a, a user just needs to kind of bring their documents and get great results? Or will there always be a degree of uh, fine tuning and tweaking that needs to happen in order to get uh, desirable results out of uh, a rag type system? We could go for a while on that one. Let me, let, let, let me, let me, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so let me te- let me tease apart a couple of pieces to it. So this is maybe a little bit of a, an optimist pessimist Rorschach test. <laughs> well, let me put it this way: it's a it's a good question, and um, and and as we tease that apart, we're actually going to get into a bunch of the subjects that I know you wanted to talk about. So so yeah, okay. So yes, what's what's our holy grail? Our holy grail is that um, you know that the process of getting my data and using it within a gen AI, you know, conversational experience. Um, and, mm-hmm. and as we've seen, you know, conversational doesn't mean just doesn't mean chat anymore because we've got multimodal and we've got drawings and pictures and actually dynamically generating a graphical user interface is something that, 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 you know, we, you know, we can do now. Right. So, yep. so, so, um, you know, but I think probably you and all, all of your listeners probably already know that, which is, is that Gen AI doesn't just mean chat anymore. It just happens to be the, the simplest way to, to prototype. But, but yeah, mm-hmm. but, but yes, the, the, the first, so let me put this, the first really important piece is, and this is not self-evident to a lot of folks. In fact, actually a lot of folks in the AI research domain don't fully get this, which is that, that real world AI, particularly like business use cases needs you to be able to bring your own data and that data and again this is really important is not a static static corpus of data like Mm -hmm. like what people are trying to do and this is why people are using rag like you're talking about data that is live data that you know is changing that is oftentimes like maybe confidential or proprietary like things like electronic medical records or people's financial statements and stuff like that is never going to get fine tuned into a model. Like it is Mm -hmm. never going into the model, which means it's always going to go into infrastructure that's around the model. So once we do that, we're talking about rag or some variant of rag, but, but the big, if you looked earlier this year, there was this, you know, it, it was, it was a charming light, charmingly naive debate on rag versus fine tuning. And it was like the answer, the, <laughs> right? And, and seriously, and you had like really smart people getting into this debate. And I was saying like things like, oh, fine tuning, like we won't need rag because of fine tuning. And I was like, I was like, you're never going to, mo- let, let me repeat again, you're never going to train a model on people's electronic me- medical records or, or, or bank statements. Right. Like if you want models leaking personal information, that's how you get models leaking personal information. Right. So, so like now most people, but that was, it was the intersection of the fact that you had a lot of people who were just very focused on building these really cool models and hadn't sort of zoomed out and said, how are we going to use this stuff in more applied ways? And so this year has been about the collision course of research and applied in the AI domain in a really exciting way, but you see it playing out in like a day by day basis. So, so we do know that, but then the question mm-hmm. becomes, okay, what do I have to do to get my data into uh, in, into a way that I can effectively retrieve it. And that's where you've got the frameworks. And I mentioned a few of them and by the way, there's a whole bunch more, but, but the Kings at this point are, are Langchain and, and Lama Index who have just been moving really, really fast on this. And you get a lot of people complaining, you know, you get a lot of people complaining about the code bases. They're like, man, like they've just, I'm like, yeah, but these guys are, are following the stack. And that's that you gotta, you gotta admire that because that's, you know, that, that, that's, that's what that's all about. Um, but as a consequence, there is a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, so I see a lot of, of rag projects. And, and so going back to what you're saying, like, is it just going to be, somebody just gonna make this dead simple? Well, yeah, ultimately there aren't a lot of people are working on it. Um, right now, when you go and do a rag project, you spend a whole bunch of time uh, it's a, and it's not dissimilar, I think. So in that way, so there's a lot of ways that an AI project this year, a gen AI project is similar to the ML projects that you and I had been looking at and involved in in previous years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of ways that they're completely different. And the ways that they're very similar is that, you know, for all the talk you're talking about, about like the cool stuff, like the day-to-day is really uh, a lot of, you know, data engineering, which is, you know, a, a euphemism for just like data cleansing and a whole bunch of, and this was, again, this is why, why are people using Python and such? Like just a whole bunch of data munge, munging just to get mm-hmm. that data from the state that people have it in into a way that's going to yield the best results. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so is that going to go away? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
it's, you know, and, and people are going to put a lot of wrappers around, uh, uh, you know, what currently requires you to do a lot of spaghetti architecture and, and particularly in, 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 and, and a lot of folks, you know, and you'll see a whole bunch of companies that focus just on that because you've got a whole bunch of data in the systems, in the databases that people are already using, they're using streaming architectures, whether they're using things like Kafka or whether they're using their databases, relational databases, whether they're using non-relational databases, like all that data needs to go into, into this stuff and it requires, and then you've got more importantly, like that's all your structured data. You've got a lot where AI starts to, to really blow things away is with unstructured data. And the unstructured data in most cases you know, again, I spoke to this earlier, the, the hello world that for, for most um, rag apps and most um, or rag frameworks and most vector databases is chat with PDF. And the piece of that is, again, how do we take apart that PDF, which is your at this point, you know, is now the canonical piece of unstructured data that everybody tests with. Um, mm-hmm. Not the most interesting one, but but the most pervasive one. (laughs) And then we go, you know, and then we go and say, okay, how do we take it apart? Is it, you know, is, and and then you start to get really into the world of mundane mundane data at that point. It's like, is this an insurance claim? Is it a legal contract? Is it a research report? Is it a whatever? And every one of those has a set of heuristics involved that may be, um, uh, maybe actually defined procedurally because, for example, in the case of a research report, you or excuse me, a, a legal document, you don't actually need like AI to take it apart. Like every contract has exactly the same structure, so you can you can just do a bunch of string munging and extract it and turn chunk it, which people do. There, there are entire companies and startups that do that. Or, or you can do things more cleverly, which is to go and in, you can have an ingestion loop where you're feeding this stuff into the LLM, having the LLM guide the ingestion flow. Um, and it, the, so you have the LLM supervising the dismantling of this unstructured content into chunks that then later at, at you know, at, at ragtime, you're then going to go and, and be able to, to grab out. Right. So, so you've got mm-hmm. those two. So, so, so again, like this is, and I'm sure, you know, cause you've got a lot of folks, a lot of your, your, um, you know, your listeners and stuff are probably in the middle of rag hell right now. And so they're probably like, hopefully nodding like, yeah, no, I just did that this week. Um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, that, the, all that stuff has to go away, but the, the pr- part of the problem becomes, it's like, like, uh, everybody's learning as we go along. And so like, you mm-hmm. don't want to prematurely optimize and automate for what the use case was last week. That was just the hello world app when what we try to do next week is, is something more complicated. Cause every, every time we, somebody brings in a new data set, um, or a new type of data, um, then, then like, it's like, okay, can we add, can we reuse the approach we used last time? Can we abstract on it? Can we build a new framework? And hence there's a new brag framework every week. Right. Um, yeah, well, that's so, a fair so, and interesting yeah. point. Like you could <laughs> yeah. over optimize on PDF, uh, retrieval and, you know, get to anchor down into that and totally miss multimodal, for example, is what you're saying. Like there's a danger to premature optimization, which is a kind of a truism in software, right? No, I mean, your example exactly was right. So, so again, most of what people are doing right now is smart knowledge bases, which by the way, mm-hmm. not a bad thing. Like a lot of use cases, a lot of practical mm-hmm. applications, a lot of happy users and a lot of businesses are going to save a lot of money and make a lot of money just having AI knowledge bases. And, and for the knowledge bases, a lot of that stuff, the content that they're sourcing from are, are you know, support contracts, things like that, that are, or whatever documents in PDF, right? But yeah. like multimodal, the stuff you see from multimodal that people are building now um, because we now have multi, obviously we have multimodal in GPT-4, but you actually have multimodal now, even in the open models. Um, you know, that's like the next phase of magic, right. Um, to be, mm-hmm. to be a little hand wavy, but, but like, that's, that, you know, that's going to be an entire, that, that is also rag based, um, uh, or can be, um, and, but it has a completely different ingestion flow. 
Mm -hmm. It has actually two pieces of ingestion flow. Um, it has it because a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here is um, uh, is data prep time, but yeah. in multimodal you have a real time ingestion flow. Like you see all of the examples where people I'm drawing a blank right now. The name of the draw program that everybody's using to do the you know you draw the thing and then you and then you the circle sketch it thing. You, yeah, uh, the sketch that right. You know what yeah. I'm talking about. Yes, right. So so the way the magic on all that on that particular use case is that they built a plugin for. It's basically an ingestion plugin, right? It's like selecting the piece of the drawing area that it's then they've gone and wired in and sends it up to GPT-4, right? So again, that's that is a nice hello world example. The minute I start applying that in 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 to different use cases, now I'm going to be like, okay, like how do I capture? Is it something from my screen? Is it something from this app? Oh, I'm taking something from you know. So there's going to be a whole bunch of software engineering that goes into into that. Yeah. No. Interesting. Interesting. So. We've talked a lot about RAG. I guess, uh, you know, a question for, for you um, that I've been grappling with a, a little bit is, you know, as a vector database, is, is kind of this vector capability, is it a feature or is it kind of a new platform? You know, I think when folks think about uh, vector databases for better or for worse. They think about kind of some of these upstart companies, but, you know, there's PG Vector for Postgres and, uh, you know, Datastax uh, now has a vector capability and, you know, all of the traditional database vendors will have a vector capability. But the question, you know, the question yes. still is open for me. No, and 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 so... All, so the answer, so obviously, you know, I'm, I'm at a vector database company, so I think about this multiple times. A day. <laughs> so my best thinking right now draws from a couple of things. So simple, to the, the you know, uh, TLDR is, it's going to be both, right? And the longer answer is um, you get a new application, you, get, you, you have a confluence of new things that, that create an opening for, for a new type of database. And so we go back, you know, 15 years ago, whenever it was, and you had um, people building with new languages, predominantly JavaScript. Um, you had people using new types of APIs, predominantly REST APIs. Um, so they're building new languages on the client. They're building new types of ways of moving the data. They were building a new runtime in the back end, people using things like Node.js, but other dynamic languages as well. And so what you had was you ended up having this data, JavaScript object notation, aka JSON. And so you had JSON on the client, you had JSON on the wire, you had JSON on the server, and then it made sense that you had JSON in the database. Mm -hmm. And that end-to-end -end created an opportunity. Now, Mongo was not the only JSON database, but... Right. But there was a need, and so at least one pure JSON database then emerged and is now, and so Mongo's doing just fine, right? Like, like mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, you had JSON as a data type, like Postgres has wonderful JSON support now, and as do most of the other databases, and there's other things. So, so, so one could, so the answer, if you were to go back 15 years ago, was like, oh, is JSON, uh, uh, you know, is it a feature or is it a new type of database? The answer was both. It wasn't, it wasn't, mm. was there, were, were there 10 new JSON databases? Well, there, there were 10 new JSON databases. There's only At one. At the time, there we were. At the, yes, <laughs> right? And, exactly. But there's one we remember. So of this current mm -hmm. batch, one or two of them is going to go and be the Mongo of this age, right? I like the sensor. Yes. Right? That makes a lot but of at sense. The same, yeah. But at the same time, you know, you are going, it is also a feature. Like a bunch of other people are going to add these things and, and uh, and it's going to be and everyone's going to bring to it kind of their special sauce. Your special sauce is yes. kind of horizontal scaling. Someone else's special sauce yeah. might be, you know, this underlying document orientation. Someone else's special sauce will be something else. Yeah, I I think the the real important piece, and this is the, it's like my refrain these days is I'm I'm more concerned with you know, and for us, and where I look at the people who are doing this right, it's like so like just follow the stack follow what people are building because that's the important piece. Like going back to the Mongo example, the important part wasn't JSON as a data type. The important part that Mongo did was it was JSON as queries, like going able to things that, that the other databases, like you go into Postgres and yeah, they added it as a JSON type and so on, but, and, and they've improved it over time, but, but 
the thing that Mongo did better than anybody else wasn't just that they could store and retrieve JSON. It was like they treated it as a first class citizen. So we needed a query, right? So it's the same mm-hmm. thing when you do that. So, this, so again, from a product strategy standpoint, I go and look at it and say, okay, what is the equivalent of that now? Like, like right. it's not just a question of, so everybody right now has gone and said, okay, I've added vector as an indexed column. So that's great. <laughs> Very good starting point. But remember, all of the vector databases were out there, all of them, whether you the ones that you everyone associate, associates as the pure plays or whether it's people who have added the capability, this all happened before RAG, RAG became a thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so now the question becomes like, which of these are like, follow, that's why again, I go back to follow the stack, follow the application, right? Like, like the ones who are, at, if are you adding features that are designed to make RAG better, right? And what, what, com, what's involved in that? Like, and we've, we spent a bunch of time talking about this stuff and we can keep, we can go into even, into even more detail, but that's, that's the other piece going back to like, again, if I, my prediction of like, if you go to a vector database website, you know, then basically it's already true. Like you're going to, again, that website's going to have two columns to it. One is going to be, here's our re- recall stats, because that's, a, that's your new stat. Like that databases used to talk about like, oh, I can handle this many requests a second. Now they're going to be like, this many requests per second with this level of precision and recall. But the other hand, on the, on the other side of that web page is going to be all about RAG, right? Because that's your that's your canonical use case. And mm-hmm. how do they make you? How do they make it uniquely easier? And so that piece, that's where got, where all the innovation is going to be. And and you know, it's going to be, and that's where you're going to see the difference. The the databases that treat it as a feature. There, if you as a developer, if I sit down to write something, I'm going to go to the ones that are act that I can tell that whether it's an open source or commercial, it doesn't matter. Like I'm going to look at and be like, are these folks focused on on trying to make this easier for me to yeah. have a have, have a rag application? And so, so yeah, yeah, we'll see. So, so long and short of it is, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it is both a feature, but you'll have one or two folks that 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 knock it out of the park and build a business on and that's always the case when we see this stuff right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and is there an infrastructure element or clearly there's an infrastructure element to this i guess more specifically i was you know having the same conversation with someone then they mentioned that they seem to suggest that there were vector databases that were kind of gpu native or gpu native enabled and take advantage of the GPU. And there are others that the, the implication was that they were um, not pure plays or something and they weren't uh, able to take advantage of the, the GPU. Is that something that you're seeing? Is that a... So when we look at, when we look at the process of retrieving data from a vector database, what we start to do, your goal is, you know, um, your goal is not to have to do a whole bunch of GPU dependent vector comparisons um, as, as your, first of all, so that comes out to the efficiency of, your, of how you built your index and so on. But, mm-hmm. but anybody who's going and, and hitting the GPU, um, you know, in, in, uh, um, in an unbounded way from, from, you know, from a vector retrieval standpoint, um, at query time, is, at query time is not going to be, um, you know, you could make the argument like, oh, that's, that's, a, you know, good thing to do, but it's not from, you know, in terms of being more GPU native and certainly the, the GPU vendors are, uh, you know, get very excited about that. Um, mm-hmm. You do at, so at query time, you are going to, you are going to hit the embedding model. Your goal is mm-hmm. to hit that once, not on a per row basis, uh, but okay. on, on the, when, when you, when you take apart. Meaning query, you embed the query. And you turn the query into a vector. Yeah, it gets a little more complicated, than that, but yes. So at their basic level, I want I, I'm going to take my input, and I want to um, you know I want to run it through an embedding model, right? And it's going to generate mm-hmm. some general embedding. My, my vector comparisons, my vector traversal, I, you can involve the GPU in that. It, like I said, you're going to put yourself in a cost prohibitive situation, and and one of the one of the key pieces of the the other key metric is is cost. A lot of a lot of these things that work really well on your laptop, you you price yourself out in terms of going into production from um, because it just costs you more money than you know. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that your 
customers have thousands of nodes. Yeah. You're, if all of those have to have GPUs, that's another class of, of yes. infrastructure cost. Yeah, and and so as we look at that, that that that's something you, you so so we go back into that. So yes, you do hit the embedding model, and as you do that, by the way, that becomes a big big selection problem, and it directly goes into uh, you know overall. Like generally, you want your your embedding model is is generally partnered or 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 derived from or optimized from the main model that you're going to be using at, at generation time. It doesn't have to be. Um, uh, depending on on, but but because what happens is again, you know, and I know you've talked a lot about RAG and and LLM chaining, but but the reason again why we have things called lang chain is because typically I go and I ask something from the agent, and they, what the embedding model does um, is it breaks down my request, and and one of the things it breaks it down into is a set of vectors of things that I want to know more about, and it farm and it farms that out into a set of queries, right? So I get maybe five, I mean, I get 15 vectors and I do the lookups of that, of all the things that that the model, that my generation model should know about when it produces the answer. And and so so when I do that, um, uh, you know, essentially, as I said, it can be, it can be, um, it, it, they don't have to, the, that first model does not have to pair with the second model. Um, Oftentimes, again, when you're doing things with like OpenAI, you're you're going to use the same embedding model that's that, you know, is uh, you know is is vector compatible with the, um, but you don't have to do that because you just retrieve everything and then feed it textually into into that. Now, by the way, depending on what you're doing, like that's your simplest your simplest sort of rag model has two LLM invocations. But the reason why people call it again Langchain, where the name comes from, is I get a multiple. LLM iterations with it, with branching and you get into all sorts of things like chain of thought and so on that for, for doing very complex answers or instruction following answers um, mm-hmm. where, you, where you can get into, into some really cool stuff. But I don't, back to your original question, because I got a little less I'm prone to do, I got a little bit off of that. I, <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't, um, uh, the question of, of, you know, the part, one of the questions that you see like the idea, do I actually need it in the database retrieval loop? No, I, I don't mm-hmm. want a GPU there. But the real que- but the bigger question becomes, do I have to, um, as I'm doing both my insertions or I'm doing my queries, for example, do, can the database can the database invoke the embedding LLM directly, or do I have to do it in my application tier? That's more of a convenience thing, but that's an important thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so you do see at, at this point, most of the vector databases, um, you know, offer that as a feature, um, as a capability, um, you know, we do as Meaning well. they'll as, take the text as opposed take to the, the te- vector yeah. and yeah. do the embedding for you. Yeah. yeah. And the other, the other thing you're, you're seeing that, again, this will be a big deal next year, um, is, uh, is a lot of the databases are going to offer you a, um, uh, a natural language query capability because it turns out that these models actually do a very good job of of uh, text to uh, to SQL text to query language types of generation. Mm-hmm. So so um, so we are going to see that as well, which is going to be really interesting when that happens because it's going to blur the lines between, for example, no SQL data- databases and SQL databases. Um, a lot of effort goes into the in, into right now um, creating your your your, uh, your your queries and and um, and like I said, a lot of effort. And it's actually a um, a lot of foundation models are putting a lot of effort into this. They already they already do a very good job because there's just because they all of course use like whether you, whether Google's using its crawl data set or everybody else that's using the common crawl. There's a lot of SQL priors on on the web. Just you know. Uh, and so, so, so these models are already very good. I mean, you can actually you can actually use Llama too and get get, or for that matter, I mean, you go to Code Llama, but just even just you know, regular Llama two will give you very good SQL, um, hmm. which is is a, an interesting thing to see. When we were talking about embeddings, you know, embedding text, you mentioned yeah. it's more complicated than that. What, what was underneath that uh, that comment? Well, so you know that was that that was in in the um, you know from from the standpoint of typically so a couple couple of pieces to that. Let's talk about it from the ingestion standpoint. Let's talk about the query piece of it. 
you know, from, from the ingestion standpoint, um, we're gener- we do an ingestion and we, we generate a, um, uh, you know, a, a um, uh, we generate the embedding vector um, the, at inserts or upserts, right? Um, and, and those are when we either create a new record or we update something. Uh, the vectors that we, the, the embeddings that we create, again, a lot of stuff happens in the application tier with chunking, which is, to, you know, we're figuring out relevant piece. But we also get into um, which uh, embedding model to use um, because the dimensionality of, of the, the vector is going to have a lot of issues from both a cost and a performance standpoint. Um, and so what you see is that uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, you see for cost purposes, a lot of people end up wanting to go and use a smaller model that does, for example, maybe a 300 dimension, right? Because we know the, the open AI, you know, open AI is of course the gold, the gold standard if I want to do it, if I've got unlimited money, I don't want to do it right, but it's going to give me a 1500 dimension vector, right? And each one of those dimensions is a floating point, right? So it's <laughs> a big thing. Um, and so ideally, uh, maybe I'm going to use one of the small 300 dimension models off a of hugging face. Problem is, whatever I use um, at ingestion time is going to be the first or one of the first um, models that I that I invoke at query time. Quite frankly, those are some of the, so so now I've got a trade off because um, because my my first you know my first model that I hit is generally is taking your raw input where you're like, hey, you right. know. Um, you know, where should I go for lunch? Um, whatever, with all the additional injected context, right? That 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 these have, that and so on. But like, you know, these these s- smaller models, um, you know, are are not going. You know, yes, they will give you that list of vectors to look up, uh, but they may not necessarily be that smart in doing it. Now, what happens is in that first pass, what it does is it's taking your, it's it's generating the goal is to generate to build the context right because everybody users think in terms of prompts but the llm takes a context which has your prompt but all of the additional information that you choose to supplement it with right and so all of that um then gets fed into the second model which is which then again typically restates your original question but says in in depending on what you're trying to do, if you if you're trying to get to a, a zero hallucination type result, you may have a system prompt. So it's got the system prompt which says you're going to get a question from the user. Then you've got the prompt underneath it, which is here's Sam's question. But the system prompt says you're going to answer this question for Sam, but you're only going to use the additional information I supply, right? So so the context has system prompt, user prompt, and then a set of the rag retrievals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the set of the rag retrievals are only as good as what that initial earlier model, what we call the, the embedding model, was able to retrieve. And yeah. if that embedding model is just not very smart, then particularly in that situation where I'm limiting my response to the stuff that was retrieved from the vector database, uh, might not be very good. Um, Mm -hmm. And then further, again, we get into the chaining situations. Like you look at the stuff people are doing uh, with like chain, like, and this is the stuff that people love, then particularly like the Langchain folks love showing off in their demos because it's really cool. Or for that matter, Mm -hmm. if you get into like the auto GPT stuff, like which, which is, is, you know, ends up being that, you know, with, with, you know, sort of an outer loop around it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. then you're actually going in and, and, you know, it may not just be one, you may be doing like several, uh, you know, um, LLM, uh, you know, essentially input prompt generation of reduction, summarization, uh, look up, li- yeah. look up list <laughs> of vectors, then feeding that in again and feeding that again, then it's prompting costly. back. Yeah. And then prompting, because again, the, the cool part of this is it's not just, uh, because it's what's what part of it's doing is it's powering a conversation, not just a, a magic. Give me the best answer. It comes back and says, "Hey Sam, um, you know, uh, did you mean did you mean this, this, or this?" Right? Because it's it's mm-hmm. and, and it gets to the point 
you know, again, through one of these, you know, chain of thought branching structures, it's like, it's like, let me, let me go back to the user and ask him now. And then it goes and, and, and does it further, but, but the quality and, and then it goes and, you know, rinse and repeat, but the quality of each one of these steps, a lot of it can come from, uh, you know, from, the, and by the way, we call these embedding models, but you know, the, one of the things that's important at RAG, and, and again, I say this as somebody who's, you know, uh, I want you people to use a vector database, but, but um, the models can generate a lot of other types of lookups. Like it may, you may also be like, give, give me a set of keywords for a conventional search. Like, like the hmm. ve- vector is not the be all end all for what the, the important part of all of this is, it, this is all about iteratively building a smart context. And vector lookup is one of your best tools for building your context, but other forms of lookup as well. I mean, yeah. You might, you might ask, you know, and again, the, your, and this is where the intersection of the vector database and what the system prompts and then the logic around it in the case of your lang chaining, you know, is, is what, where it goes into because part of it might be generate, you know, one might imagine a, a, a trip planning thing. And it's like, and by the way, gen, give me a list of zip codes to look up. And that's perfectly valid. Like it's not a vector lookup. It's, a, it's just a zip code lookup. And, and that's perfectly mm-hmm. fine. Or, or give me a, give me a numeric range of prices based on the iteration, you know, based on things that the model has, has, and, and again, the model may be fine tuned on concepts. Like we may have sort of some concept of affordability that the model is able to opine on that says if the user meant they wanted something low cost that they meant in this context between $5 and $25, in which case, again, that might be a lookup, a separate lookup from a, from a from a product catalog or a restaurant pricing lookup, like the 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 iterate the you know options on this are endless. Like you're going to have a lot of stuff that people are, and you already see this. Like a lot of these apps that people are building are very sort of you know domain specific that are based around building domain specific context. And it would be great to imagine that somehow I can just throw more AI computing power, but it's but you can't, I mean, you can, but they, uh, but the model, the model can't solve this on its own. This is a conversation between the model and the data, some of which is happening in the background while you're sitting there waiting for the response. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I gave you too much information again, maybe, maybe what you need is, uh, maybe my answers should be mediated by an LLM first, uh, to, to get them uh, a little bit more uh, concise. <laughs> No, this is great stuff, and I appreciate um, I appreciate the additional context, I guess, uh, and what you're seeing from a vector database and, and RAG perspective. It's fun because what, what it translates into is it is the intersection of a whole bunch of, I mean, again, there's a whole bunch of, as you look at the things we talked about, there's a whole bunch of very mundane, like data prep and data, data, data cleansing, data integration, a lot of stuff that, that, by the way, is not hugely a lot of fun, but, but the minute, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's, it, it's still, it's a data engineering project. We have, we have a whole bunch of stuff that's very model specific and, it, and one can lose themselves in, uh, in, in the model domain because it's, it's fascinating and so on. But then you just got a whole bunch of software engineering and architecture around this stuff. And right. the, the, the part that makes it hard is that, like when you start getting like like each one of those like sure there's you know half a million um, uh, data uh, uh, data engineers and data scientists in the world um, which by the way is not a huge number given that uh, well you know given that there's about twenty five million developers in the world right so so we look at that and so then we go and say the number of people who understand software architecture you know pretty well and and whatever and you've got so so you know, who can, who can arch- architect around these things. And that's probably about 15 million developers. And then you have like number of actual, like AI model data scientists, which is probably actually, you know, at this point, uh, mm-hmm. probably a hundred thousand to 200,000. Right. And then you've, the problem is, is like the intersection of those and you start to get down into like a very small number of them, the majority of whom are at hackathons in San Francisco. Right. And so <laughs> and, and um, I think this is kind of the heart of my probably my <laughs> first question, which is, you know, there's another element of this Venn diagram, which is like 
You know, we talk about rag like it's this new thing, but that retrieval, like that's information retrieval. We've been studying yeah. this for decades. And there's a smaller number of people that are really experts at IR and right. have been working on search. And are we going to need that expertise for these systems to kind of fully meet their potential? Or are we going to be able to abstract that away? Or will the LLMs be able to do that for us so that... You know, I don't need to tweak my embeddings, you know, my chunking and my context and my hierarchy and all that stuff. It's one of these that's I, I come back to that because it's a question that I've been thinking a lot about recently and asking a lot of people about trying to come up with some uh, kind sure. of forward looking thoughts on. No, and I, I you're asking another question. And and so the good news is that there will be a ton of uh, the, the, the I mean, we've seen this plenty of times with every, everything, you know, uh, you know, everything new, like the first iterations of it. So, so you look at what happened over the last year, right? Like the first thing was you had this stuff and it was unoptimized. Um, so when we look at Gen AI, it was, yeah. it was, it was certainly unoptimized, but it worked. And one could say maybe it just barely worked, but it was on, it was on unoptimized, which meant it was expensive as hell. Right. And then we get, mm -hmm. we get to, you know, and then we get to, to say mid year, um, and quantization comes onto the scene and it makes it possible to now like actually go and run your models on consumer GPUs. And then shortly mm -hmm. thereafter, you saw optimization coming in that allowed it to actually run without needing a GPU. Like they're, you know, you can it's actually, run, it's not very fast, but you can run this stuff yeah. on, on Intel. And so what you're seeing, and, and then by the way, we all love Python, but Python, you know, is like, or is a magnitude slower because it's not meant to be a performance language, right? Um, and so part of what you're seeing, we'll see, so first thing you see is the optimization phase. And the second phase is just like the, the important part of, and I love the fact that you tied it back to like information retrieval and search, right? So the thing though is that's an extremely, like that is an extremely ubiquitous and mainstream use case. Like like people are going to need to to, like every company is going to need to take, every company generates information and knowledge. And mm -hmm. AI enabling it has can't be like a let me go and hire some some AI research grad students. It has to be an off the shelf proposition, and yeah. it has to happen where that information sits. So so yes, so that's going to happen too. By by the way, right? So so all of these things make sense. But but I think we're right now like at the point where it's it, a lot of it is roll your own, and and it will be for yeah. probably another year. And so but the good news again is. I mean, again, if you're like worried about this stuff putting uh, the developers out out of their jobs, it's like no, you just need to start. You need to start working with this stuff and 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 learning it. Like there, and you know, there's going to be an awful lot of of you know an awful lot of coding that's going to be happening for for a long time to come around this. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, I. But yeah, it should get easier. It will get easier. But the but as it gets easier, people are going to then do harder. Like you just pointed out, like right now, things. everybody's just trying. <laughs> right now, everybody's. I, I mean, I actually loved. I'm going to use that. A, a, you know, your 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 point there, because um, it really was it's like now we're just getting people are just getting to the point where they can do text based rag in a fairly formulaic way, and now we got multi modal, right? Yeah. And so so yeah. Right. So, so you got it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Ed, uh, great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us and sharing a bit about uh, kind of your take on, on RAG and Vector DBs. Awesome. This, this was a lot of fun. <laughs>